contact the people to interview later? Or? Yeah. Is it good? Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming um, in this, uh, you know, rainy evening. We appreciate it. Uh, my name is Bernard Fajardo, and I'm a bookseller here at Politics and Prose. On behalf of the owners and of the staff, I would like to welcome all of you to your favorite bookstore for this evening's event. As you may already know, Politics and Prose uh, have gone back to hosting in-person events along with our virtual book events, partnered events, trips, and classes. Uh, so please check our website for a full list of our upcoming uh, events. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. First, while we have lifted the mask mandate here in the store, you are encouraged to wear a mask uh, throughout the event, and we can provide one for you if you did not bring one. Uh, if you could also turn off or silence your cell phones, we would really appreciate it. Uh, for the Q&A, please remember to step up to, one, to the microphone over here by the pillar um, before asking your questions so we can not only hear and enjoy the conversation, but to also ensure that it is going to be recorded. For those of you who want to buy copies of the book, we are selling it right behind the cash registers at the front of the store. We will be doing a signing after the Q&A, so if you would like to get your book signed, please line by the, line by the pillar with, by the microphone, and we will come by to ask your name for personalization. So please have your books ready. And lastly, once the event is complete, we ask that you fold up your chairs, lean them against something solid uh, to help us out a bit. Uh, now onto the main event. I am honored to introduce Robin D.G. Kelly to all of you. He is the Distinguished Professor and Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair in U.S. History at UCLA. Tonight, he will talk about his seminal work on the influential history of 20th century black radicalism, which has been revised and expanded by Beacon Press to celebrate its 20th anniversary. So, this is about Freedom Dreams. Uh, first published in 20 2002, uh, Freedom Dreams is a staple in the study of the black radical tradition unearthing the history of renegade intellectual and artists uh, of the African diaspora in the 20th century, Kelly lays the foundations for modern conceptions of black radical visions and movements. Uh, the New York Times book review calls it a bold and provocative celebration of the black radical imagination in the 20th century. So everyone, uh, Professor Robin D.G. Kelly. I feel like I should keep the mask on because I was eating pizza with Dave's iron and I had, I had broccoli. So <laughs> I'm trying to make sure you don't see anything in my teeth. Um, anyway, um, it's great that, that the great Dave's iron is even showing up for this uh, uh, event. And let me, before I begin anything, let me just say congratulations on the workers of Politics and Prose for being the first and only union bookstore in Washington, D.C. And I think if we, can, if we can basically show solidarity and say you know, we're, we're going to do talks at union bookstores and we're just going to withdraw our labor from all those other ones, then we might be able to make a difference here. So I'm really just so proud to be here. I think the last time I was here might have been for the first edition in 2003 around that time. So and it's great to be here in that circumstance and also um, and just to see so many friends and, and folks. I know some people will be coming in a little bit later. Um, and I won't uh, start naming names, except I, should, I have to mention the great Esther Ivarum, who's, <laughs> who's an, um, an amazing figure here in DC as a journalist, as a radio host, as a brilliant f uh, scholar, writer, and friend from way, way back. Some of my sister's good friends from back when I, before I could even read, you know. Okay, so um, to be here in Washington, D.C., in the nation's capital, is interesting. You know, I'm always trying to acknowledge the place I am in. Um, I mean, if you read the new epilogue to the book, um, you'll see a story about how this uh, uh, regime in Washington, D.C. is dismantled by 100 million poets. 
and it's in the book, so you can, you can read about it, um, in my speculative uh, fiction. This is Chocolate City. Uh, this is also the city of Freedom Dreamers. Uh, it's the home of Drum and Spear Press and Bookstore, the home of James Early and Jimmy Garrett and Marvin Holloway and the Center for Black Education. Um, it's the home of the D.C. Rape Crisis Center in the late 70s and 80s, with the, led by extraordinary activists uh, like Nkenge um, Toure, uh, Deirdre Wright, Loretta J. Ross, Yolanda Ward, who paid uh, for the work she was doing with her life. And right now, you have in this great city so many different movements and organizations. Um, oh, it's the great Derricka Purnell. Hi. How you doing? Coming? This is, this is also the city of Derricka Purnell, one of the great uh, abolitionists. But it's also the city of, of Harriet's wildest dreams, right? The city of defund MPD coalition. And like I said, the city of the author of Becoming Abolitionist, which you carry in this bookstore. Um, now, to the question at hand, um, why a 20th anniversary edition? Um, what's the point? Um, and it's not to sell books, because to be honest, the book never went out of print. It was still in print. Now, it is true that you can get a free copy as a PDF, and most people get it that way. Um, but, you know, I'm rich. I don't need money, <laughs> you know? So it's not like I need money. But that's the, so the point of this, um, <laughs> of the 20th anniversary edition is that I felt compelled to take stock of sort of where we are now, especially in the wake of the 2020 protests, um, in the wake of the Occupy movement, which we have to remember wasn't that long ago and still is in existence, um, in the wake of anti-police protests erupting long before 2020. In fact, this has been the history of this country, but you know, you think about uh, what happens beginning with what's been called the Trayvon Generation, 2013-2014. And of course, what does it mean to take stock of the world, let alone this country, uh, in the face of resurgent fascism, which is clear response to all these radical insurgencies? Um, we've witnessed over the last two decades an extraordinary expansion um, of our radical vision, one that I, I just you know, sometimes I think about it, I look around and see how far we've come over the last 20 years. And, you know, it's not about um, victories per se. I'll talk about that in a second. But think about just how expansive, how much at the forefront feminist, queer, trans movements, indigenous movements uh, for decolonization, climate justice, disability justice, these are more at the forefront than they've ever been before. And despite a tendency toward more identity-driven politics, we're also seeing a trend toward more inclusive organizing. And this proves the point that I was trying to make back in the 1990s before some of you were born, um, when I was arguing with, with Todd Gitlin you know, about what, what he disparagingly, he and others, Michael Tomaski, all these people who got good jobs now, um, <laughs> disparagingly sort of sort of dismisses identity-driven politics. And in fact, part of the argument was, and your mom is dysfunctional and elsewhere, is that if people can determine the self, you know, and really engage the self, um, and do so in a way that is concerned with the rest of the world, then identity of difference is not an obstacle. It is, it is the basis, can be the basis, of a new kind of solidarity. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, and I have my own critiques, but it, it often happens that way. In any case, um, the new edition includes a beautiful foreword by poet, activist Aja Monet. Um, and if you, if, you, if you just buy this book and just read the foreword, it's worth the money. I'm just saying. Oh, Karen? Really? Okay, sorry. I thought I, thought I saw my, my cousin. I did. Hey, Karen, I, I, you know, with the mask. So my cousin is here. <laughs> okay. And I should, I should be naming everyone, my former student, Nancy, Josh Myers, all these other people. And some other people I probably don't recognize because you all have masks on. So if I don't, forgive me. You didn't have to come, though. You know, I was telling Lisa Gay, you know, don't come. Um, anyway, so just to, to go on, 
So the new edition includes this beautiful forward by Aja Monet. Um, you can buy the book and cut out the forward and put it on your wall and then just leave the rest of the book because it really captures everything. Um, the introduction is long and expansive and it is a reflection not only on where we've come from, and not so much where we're going because I don't really do that. I don't predict the future. Um, but it really does acknowledge the profound impact that certain revolutionaries like Grace Lee Boggs and Seiko Sundiata have had on this book. Um, the introduction talks about some of the artists and activists who have turned freedom dreams from freedom dreaming, uh, you know, from dreams to dreaming, that is from noun to verb. And I also talk a lot about some of the artists, activists, intellectuals who have really taken up some of the themes in the book, I mean, like Aja Monet, for example, or the rapper, poet, activist, no name, uh, the, arc, the artist, architect, Laura Halsey, um, the filmmaker, curator, Aaron Christobel, uh, the dancer, choreographer, Shamel Bell, who's a former student of mine, and then all these amazing musicians from Terry Lynn Carrington and Nicole Mitchell, some more Pinder Hughes, James Brandon Lewis, um, including the project that he put together with the great poet Thomas Sayers Ellis, Heroes Are Gang Leaders, which if you take Heroes Are Gang Leaders, it kind of spells out Hegel. Just think <laughs> about that. That's the, that was the point. Anyway, it's too many to name, and it's all in, in the text. Um, and also entire movements that I feel like really do embody the themes of the book in its original uh, iteration, like BYP 100, or We Charge Genocide, the dissenters, Asada's daughters, and so on. Um, and it contains an, a new epilogue, which replaces the original epilogue, which I'm not going to read from tonight. You should uh, check it out. Um, I was kind of making a, not really a joke, but I was describing it. When I talked about 100 million poets converging onto Washington, D.C. and dismantling uh, the old state as we know it, um, that's actually in the book, in a piece that I actually wrote uh, originally for the first edition of the book, and I pulled it for various reasons, which we could talk about, and, but I decided to restore it in this edition. Um, and in that epilogue, uh, I talk about how some of the book's core ideas have also been taken up by whole cities, uh, places like Detroit, uh, uh, Michigan, in terms of the kind of Detroit Renaissance that's emerging, um, Jackson, Mississippi, which we could talk about, uh, and to be clear, there are so many examples I don't talk about in the book, which I think are worth thinking about. Like, for example, some of you may or may not know that this is the 40th anniversary of the history of Black Workers for Justice. How many people have heard of Black Workers for Justice? Raise your hand. Okay, it's one of the most important organizations founded in Rocky Mount in 1982. Rocky Mount, uh, North Carolina, it's North Carolina based, um, and it really is. Uh, a kind of radical labor organization without being a union that has shaped so many struggles to this day. And right now, as one of the projects of the Black, Work, Black Workers for Justice, um, I'm involved with a group called Community South. Community South is a, um, rooted in Rocky Mount, but it's also kind of a national organization that does political education um, and you know, builds worker power. It's supporting the Southern Workers Assembly right now. Uh, if you want to donate to Community South, you can just go to communiversitysouth.org. There's a donate button on the upper right hand side. Give them money. Um, they got a physical space now. They're trying to develop a library. And their constituency is the black working class. I don't mean like the fake black working class, I mean the actual black working people, many of whom are living precarious lives. And they are not just the benefactors, they're the leaders, right, uh, organizing. Okay, that's what's in the book. What I want to do is I want to spend more time having a conversation, so I'm just going to read uh, from uh, part of the introduction, and then we'll just open up for a conversation. Okay. And this is, uh, and it's funny because Dave and I were just talking about this question of optimism. Okay. <clears throat> In the face of growing pessimism, freedom dreams may come across as too hopeful and optimistic in these dark times. 
but the book is hardly optimistic. In fact, the word optimism never appears in the book, only optimistic in the title of Jane Cortez's poem, which is a critique of being cheerful and optimistic in the face of catastrophe. Nor does the word pessimism appear, although pessimistic comes, to, comes up once in describing the post-emancipation generation's outlook on the future. When I use the word hope, it does not mean wishful thinking or even dreaming. The black radical imagination is not a kind of dream state, conjured and nurtured, independent of the day-to-day -day struggles on the ground, but rather is forged in collective movements. My central point is that we cannot divorce critical analysis from social movements. The challenges of solidarity and a deep understanding of the mechanisms of oppression generate the conditions and requirements for new modes of analysis, new ways of being together. Therefore, it is not enough to imagine a world without oppression, especially since we don't always recognize the ways in which we ourselves practice and perpetuate oppression. We must also understand the mechanisms or processes that not only reproduce subjugation and exploitation, but make them common sense and render them natural or invisible. The book does not prioritize freedom dreams to the exclusion of fascist nightmares. If anything, I show that freedom dreams are born of fascist nightmares, or better yet, born against fascist nightmares. The very context for the book, today and 20 years ago, was the nightmare goal of global war, neoliberalism, and racialized state-sanctioned violence. I write these words on the eve of the 20th anniversary of 9-11, um, and this is when I wrote these words, as President Joe Biden uh, declares an end to a war that cost $2.3 trillion and at least 170,000 lives, as Taliban forces take over Afghanistan and a defeated U.S. military scrambles to evacuate its citizens and Afghan friends. The parallels are striking. I first proposed the book idea to my editor, Jeb Tasman, on February 28, 2000, two days after 3,000 of us marched down Manhattan's Fifth Avenue to protest the acquittal of the officers who killed Amdou Diallo. An unarmed uh, Guinean immigrant shot 41 times after police reportedly mistook his wallet for a gun. By the time I completed the manuscript, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney had stolen an election. Remember that? <laughs> the Department of Homeland Security was a reality. The World Trade Center was rubble. Bombs were raining down on the Afghan people. Lower Manhattan was under martial law and the U.S. Were pre was preparing to invade Iraq. I've had to remind readers that the movements featured here lived through much darker times than the early Bush years. The black search for homeland and, you know, took place at the height of racist reaction as the Bourbon South defeated Reconstruction, stripped black men of the vote, made lynching the primary mode of discipline and punishment, and established a Jim Crow racial regime. Black communists spread their message of liberation during the worst global economic crisis and at the height of the Red Scare. In the 60s and 70s, a group of black radicals envisioned the imminent collapse of the American empire, just as US militarism and the national security state expanded and police violence intensified. Ida B. Wells and Anna Julia Cooper boldly asserted that genuine human freedom was impossible without the emancipation of black women during what many historians consider to be the darkest period of African-American history since chattel slavery. Angela Davis produced startlingly radical visions of freedom from a cage. And the Combahee River Collective drafted its famous statement on sexual as sexual violence and femicide against black women was rising across the country. These movements were fueled not by false optimism, but by a deep understanding of reality. They were trying to sustain life by beating back the death-dealing structures of gendered racial capitalism. The only way to ensure survival for black people was to envision a radically different future for all and fight to bring it into existence. It is in the fight that visions of the future are forged, clarified, revised, or discarded. For this reason, Freedom Dreams was never meant to be a manifesto or a roadmap. It did not predict the future or present a plan of action or claim to be the catalyst for a new radical insurgency 
Instead, it humbly offered a different take on histories of social movements by centering their visions of the future. Now, this seemed important at the time because I kept encountering student activists disillusioned with both the academy and the liberalism of the Clinton era uh, who were seeking radical alternatives. Despite what seemed to me uh, an abundance of radical organizations in our midst, they looked nostalgically to the 1960s for what they believed were successful models of revolution. But I wondered, what does success mean for movements committed to fundamentally transforming society? Does it mean winning campaigns? taking state power, passing laws that are transformative? What does it mean to win, and why does it matter? The focus on winning was not limited to college students aspiring to become revolutionaries, but had been baked into movement culture with the expanded role of the nonprofit industrial complex. Back then, and to a large degree even now, US social movements depended on foundations. Funders put their money behind winnable campaigns, often undercutting the difficult and patient work of collective thinking, base building, cultivating a vision of the world activists are trying to build. Freedom Dreams was an attempt to move beyond a bipolar understanding of social movements as either winning or losing, to focus, focus instead on the collective radical imagination that conjures and sustains visions of freedom even in the darkest times. I jump to the end. It should be clear by now, and will become clearer as you read this book, hopefully, that the black radical imagination does not stand still. It lives and breathes and moves with the people. The best we can do is catch a glimpse of how people in motion have envisioned the future and what they did to try to realize or enact that future. But every freedom dream shares a common desire to find better ways of being together without hierarchy and exclusion, without violence and domination, but with love, compassion, care, and friendship. My daughter, Eliza Kelly, who is a professor at Yale University now, who was 11 years old when this book came out, um, and who lived with this book longer than anyone besides me, uh, grasped this core truth with astonishing clarity. When asked by an interviewer whether progressive movements can retool citizenship as a way to reproduce a culture of care, she replied, better ships than citizenship include friendship, relationship, or even a pirate ship, <laughs> yeah. where unauthorized motley formations are bound together to disrupt notions of, private, of the private, of property, of wealth, and its concentration. I think one of the worst aspects of citizenship is that it needs authorization, or that its expression is tied to what is given by a governing body. The kind of citizenship I dream of is one where we acknowledge our attachment to each other, desire to be attached to one another in relations other than property relations, where serving the other is a way of serving the self. It sounds very romantic, but isn't that the origin of all the things we want to make and bring into the world? The power of the love letter is that it is written without the guarantee of a response. And to that I say, in what are radical social movements, if not love letters? Thank you. So, so um, OK, that convinced you to definitely buy the book, just to hear my daughter speak. So we're just here to have a conversation. You know, Don't ask me what we're going to do next. Because again, I'm not, I don't predict the future. You know? We try to make sense of where we are, and we could all figure that out ourselves, depending on what we do. Questions, thoughts, comments, you know, contentions, arguments. Yes. Oh, there I got. Yeah. Oh. I think they're recording this. This is for Bill Maher. <laughs> Hi, yes, I just have a very, very simple question. So I love that you reminded us that we've been through darker times and we've endured more. And when I think about that and I have a moment of hope, hopefulness, I also realize that W.B. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells and Anna Julia Cooper were not on Instagram. 
<laughs> so I am also curious about the context in which our dark times are forming and how you wrestle with the continuities of history and the discontinuities of history when reminding us that, you know, we've made it and look at all these dreams, but now, yeah, the, the times have shifted. So I would love to hear how you engage right. that. That's, that's a really great question. And it's so funny because I think if you had asked that question maybe two days ago, I might give you a different answer. But let me give you two answers. One answer is I'm thinking about um, my really good friend who passed away recently, Julia Scott. Julia Scott wrote a book called Common Wind, and it's about the Haitian Revolution. And you know, um, he just happened to be Eliezer's godfather as well. So he's been on my mind. And in this book, he shows something which is spectacular. That is that the story of what was happening in Haiti spread throughout the um, Western Hemisphere faster than the slave masters could get it. It was like miraculous. In other words, they didn't have social media, but it's amazing how there was this thing called black news, you know, passed on through, um, through seamen and through you know, travelers and through enslaved people moving back and forth. And I think in many ways, um, Instagram, social media moves knowledge, information very, very fast, lightning speed. Um, it connects people in ways. Um, it also moves a lot of falsehoods and a lot of mythologies. And um, in some ways, it can, it can, it doesn't always do this, but it does have the potential of giving folks a sense of either false optimism or false pessimism, right? The false optimism is, you know, I'm in my room and I'm making revolution. <laughs> look, I got, look how many likes I got. So you know I'm making revolution. The other false pessimism is that we, we are told, like, there's no way we can win this, you know? Sometimes you don't know what you could win unless you're sort of in the streets or in the communities or in the house or in the conversation in real time. Um, and sometimes when you're in real time and you look at someone in the face, like if I'm looking at you, if I'm an organizer and I really, really do believe in what we're doing, I can't look at you and say, you know what, we're not going to win. I could say, we need to figure out something else. Come, some other kind of strategy, because now I got you, I, your eyes are in my eyes, and I cannot sort of beat us down when in fact it's that sense of possibility that often drives people to do things that are impossible. And that's something you do in the flesh, you know? So I'm not at all critical, I'm not saying that we should abandon that, I'm saying that there's some great things about it, some things that do change the game in many ways. I mean, the fact that um, in this era of heightened nationalism, we have more cross-border connections through social media than we've ever had before, you know, which is great. So I do think that, um, that there's got to be a way where you know, we should be able to use the tools without allowing the tools to use us. You know, um, and if we go back and think about the last 20 years of struggle, social media has been key in terms of mobilizing people, but no campaign has ever been won from social media. Show me one. Just show me one. Ferguson, you know because you were there. P people might have come there because of social media, but they weren't, they had to be there in the streets. You know, same thing. We talk about Dream Defenders in Florida. People were there. They were in the halls of, of government. Government. They were in the streets. They were doing what they had to do to make things visible. And it's, it's exactly that visibility of struggle that actually has an impact on social media. So wait a second. Something's happening. You know, It was 26 million people in the streets, not 26 million tweets, that you know, led to this, uh, both the possibility of, uh, of an actual movement to defund police and prisons and produce what? It's fascist reaction, you know? So that, I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's 
sort of my answer to all this. I do just want to go back again and just say something about the common wind. Our capacity to communicate across time and space, even without machines, is something we have to sort of pay attention to because I think it's amazing. So thank you. Anyone else? Thoughts? Yeah, I, yes. I appreciate your talk. Um, I would like you to expand on the concept of neoliberalism and how you characterize it in the negative. Oh, in the negative. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is neoliberalism? Um, I teach a course on neoliberalism, by the way, so I'm, I'm going to try not to be here for 10 weeks. <laughs> um, we have to begin with liberalism, and I am not a fan of liberalism. Um, I think we get confused what liberalism is. Liberalism in the 18th, 19th century context means free markets. It sort of means free labor, but liberals actually don't have any issue with unfree labor. We've, they've proven that. Um, but it means free markets. It means laissez-faire. Uh, it means um, a state whose role it is to protect capital. Because under liberalism, the liberalism is about capitalism. Liberalism is not in opposition to capitalism. It is the ideology of capitalism. You know, there were conservatives who were not necessarily great on free markets, but liberals actually are conservatives on less. less so that's so we begin with liberal, liberalism. Over time, liberalism took on a different valence. By the time you get to the Progressive Era and the New Deal in the 1930s, because things were happening. Workers were organizing, workers were forming unions. They were pushing for a welfare state, saying that the state should play much more of a robust role in providing a social safety net for people, right? And the progressive era, which wasn't necessarily a great time, it's not really that progressive, it was really based on social Darwinism too, it's still based on the idea of governmental efficiency. And the governmental efficiency, right, should be um, much more robust in terms of managing the economy. Um, Laissez-faire is like you don't need to manage the economy because the invisible hand that even Adam Smith was, had some issues about, um, but the invisible hand would just sort of run things. That invisible hand's never been invisible. That invisible hand, of course, is, has a velvet glove but an iron fist behind it because the only way that capitalism is able to reproduce itself and keep winning um, and is through violence. That's why the one thing that the state always does, it provides what? Security for capital, police, armies, navies. You know, it uses its power to take land, not to buy land. <laughs> Homestead Act to um, eminent domain. It's all basically the same thing. Take an indigenous people's land, just take it. And then use it for what? Use it for low income housing? No. <laughs> they use it for capital. So neoliberalism, in some ways, is, was the reaction to the expansion of the liberal welfare warfare state, saying that, okay, well, we need to shrink the welfare part of it, expand the warfare part of it, and really begin to privatize everything, everything. You know, public parks, no, you pay a fee, you know? Um, public education, free in California. Did you know that? You go to university for free. And really, in my lifetime, they started charging tuition. I go to Cal State Long Beach where it was $90 a semester. Now it's several thousand dollars. UCLA, it's like $25,000. So the privatization of everything is part of the neoliberal order. That's, part, that's only part of it. The other part of it is the idea that, um, that nations around the world should have no self-determination or the right to govern themselves when it comes to capital. And that's why part of what we see in the neoliberal era is uh, an attention to borders and boundaries, right? More border patrol, more border violence to sort of control the movement of human beings. But capital has no borders or boundaries. So imagine in a neoliberal order, if the head of state in a country in Latin America says, we're going to have a minimum wage, a living wage, we're going to end 
we're going to basically take over the mines. Mining um, uh, in all the subsoil rights will be the states, right? Um, we're going to have strict rules against environmental um, uh, 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 pollution and, and damage. The neoliberal order is like, no, you can't do that because it's a violation of capital's rights. And if you continue to do that, we'll just overthrow you. You know, that's why Chile is one of the great neoliberal experiments. The opening, one of the openings, but even before that, um, all of Africa <laughs> was part of the big, great neoliberal experiment. So neoliberalism is a terrible thing, um, not because it is a worse kind of capitalism. It's because capitalism is a terrible thing. It is the latest iteration of capitalism, not formed because the neoliberals won. They won because of the economic crisis of 1971 to 74, which then um, forced a lot of countries dealing with OPEC, dealing with the, the decline in the value of the dollar, the US coming off the gold standard, all that stuff produced an economic crisis that they used the crisis itself to shore up the power of neoliberal ideology. You know? And this is why it's not a good thing, in my opinion. And finally, uh, neoliberalism knows no party. It knows no party. There's no, the Republicans are no more or less neoliberal than the Democrats. And that's the one thing they all have in common. They all adopt that. Whether we're talking about your favorite, Obama, Clinton, the first black president, you know, all of them, they're all neoliberals because that's the position that they hold in terms of the importance of the belief that if you can allow the economy to run wild based on CEOs, based on what um, economic needs are for capital, then that's going to somehow be good for everyone else, even though they don't believe that. And what we get is greater inequality, greater homelessness, and greater catastrophe, and where we are now. I know it's a long answer, but it didn't take 10, ten weeks. Yes, go on. I'll, I'll be shorter. First of all, thank you for sharing time with us and being with us. It's much appreciated. Um, I, thank you. I'm supposed to talk louder through the mask. Sorry. Okay. Um, you model some very exemplary behaviors and, and knowledge and wisdom t to me. <laughs> me? me? <laughs> but, like me? Uh, yeah. Okay. It, it, what I'm trying to get at is it's the actual doing. It's the actual living out of your convictions. And I'm wondering what additional perspectives you would have on the worthwhileness it is to engage the real politic with all its foolishness mm -hmm. at times as not, not so much a direct contrast, but a reality of taking care of self, relating to one another, um, uh, pr crafting the things we ought to do. Right. Is that simple enough, I hope? Ooh, that's, it's a hard question because um, I, I, I don't see myself, I see myself as making mistakes every five minutes <laughs> and messing up. So all I can say is that I work really hard to be like my mother. And my mother is uh, 10 times the person I could ever be. I'll never, uh, you know, which is okay. Like, I'm not feeling bad about that. I'm just very happy she raised, she's just like that. Um, and, 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 and to go back to the book Freedom Dreams, the introduction to the original, um, which is still linear, uh, the, the first edition, edition talks about my mother and her being the inspiration for the book, really, uh, in terms of, of what she was able to see in people and what she was able to see in the darkness. Like she found beauty everywhere. Like she was seeking it. You know, she, she was like right in front of us. Um, and what it meant to engage in what we call today mutual aid, which for her was just being a good follower of Paramahansa Yogananda. You know, like you just care for other people. Like you care for the planet. Everything that's alive including the bookshelves, you care for them. And she, she modeled that, you know. Um, I wish I could be that, that good. Um, but, I just, uh, but I do want to acknowledge how hard it is. Um, I'm lucky because I'm not living on the street, you know. I'm not, my life is not precarious. Um, it was precarious growing up in Harlem, um, but 
I have a really good life. I make good money. I got people who take care of me. And not everyone has that. So not everyone can do that. And I think that capitalism, racial capitalism, gendered racial capitalism, the way it actually affects people, I'm amazed at not more crazy people, you know, especially among us. It's not more crazy people. The fact that they are able to survive and persevere against those kinds of odds, which is a system that is meant to destroy you and reduce you to either a brand, a cog in a machine, or it's completely disposable. That's what it's designed to do, right? So I'm very lucky that I don't have to live that right now, but I don't think it's acceptable for any of us to say, well, I made it. The rest of y'all could just, you know, whatever happens. We can't afford that, you know. Um, that's not what it means to be, uh, to be alive. I don't want to say human, but to be alive. Because to be alive is to recognize the liveness of everything around you. And, you know, one of the amazing, amazing things about, um, about the life of, of animals that are not humans is their capacity to care for each other. I just give you one little story. You come this way, but um, I'll give you one little story. Like, you know, people read Peter Kropotkin on mutual aid and animal life. But as, when I was in New Orleans after Katrina, my wife was working on a show there. Um, and Karen, you probably know this story. So we go to uh, this, this kind of animal reserve. And it's basically all these animals that have been like, you know, kidnapped and held circus animals and, and wild animals that should be in the wild. And they would basically take care of them. Well, during Katrina, the floods were coming, and they had to abandon the animals. So all the tall animals, like the giraffes and stuff, they, were at the, they all gathered the small animals and put them up at the top of this hill. So they're all up on top of the hill, and the tall animals at the bottom of the hill standing guard. And when they got there, it was like all the animals were organized to defend and protect each other, even the carnivores. That was deep. And we can't do that. See, if we, so we're not even as smart as those animals. Or at least we don't care. Right? Our smartness is not always smartness is about making bombs, right? Rather than making life. And so that to me, those those are the questions that we have to confront every morning when we get up. You know, what are we gonna do? So well, I appreciate the question. Okay. I, I promise I'll I'll go shorter. Hey Dr. Kelly. Hey. So in the book you write about the general conspiracy to silence some of the more radical freedom drains from the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping if you could elaborate on that point in our contemporary moment by talking about the Republic of New Africa, Chokle Lumumba, and the former Black Panthers who are finally leaving prison and mm -hmm. continuing to do that work. If you could just talk about that. Okay. There's lots of ways to enter. That's a great question, by the way. I'll just say two things. It's funny because when I wrote the book 20 years ago, part of what I was dealing with was the way in the 1990s there was a kind of revision of the 60s and 70s. Um, it was like either hippies, counterculture, and, or radicals who were just not realistic. And what's good about, and this is a positive and negative, what's good about this generation, this younger generation, is that they know a lot more. Like, you can go, you, again, to go back to Derek's point about Twitter, people would talk about the Black Panther Party uh, in very different ways than they did 20 years ago. You know, um, they talk about things like the plan to create an alternative to the police, right? Um, what it means to engage in mutual aid and the, the slogan, uh, uh, survival pending revolution, as a positive thing. Um, we have a different appreciation for the Panthers uh, in a way that that wasn't the case um, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, so there's that. On the other hand, and don't be mad at me for all the people who love Beyonce. <laughs> just don't get mad at me. Well, get mad at me, but uh, just don't tell me about it. Um, when one of the most sort of difficult moments 
was when Beyonce did the Super Bowl halftime show, and it was a celebration of Black Panther Party. And it was cool. I mean, look, any celebration of Black Panther Party is a good thing, except when you create a spectacle that's all about style and no substance, when in fact that very, very moment when they're on that stage, um, there are people who were fighting to get out of prison. Now, what they could have done is had a list of all the political prisoners on the, on the field, just list their names, you know? They could have done that, and they didn't do that. Instead, it became this, like, style politics, and the Black Panther Party became something to celebrate from the past rather than the present and the future. And right now, there's still people in prison, right? So to me, that's the work that we have to do. Republican New Africa is a really, really great question because, of course, all this talk about Jackson, Mississippi right now, those of us who know this history, and I write a little bit about it, um, know that the reason that there is even a movement drawing attention to the, the long-standing crisis of infrastructure in Jackson is because of the Republic of New Africa. In 1970, 71, they decided to move down to Mississippi and take that state, to take it as an independent black nation. And they did. <laughs> they got to Jackson, and slowly over time, after political prisoners and state violence and everything, Chokwe Lumumba Sr. was elected mayor through the People's Assemblies and all this organizing work. And it was Chokwe, his father, Anta's, far, Anta's father, father, walking around with big blocks of, of the shows, like, this is what's happening to the infrastructure. It's falling apart. We need money. And this is what happens when a revolutionary organization is able to hold some semblance of power, but that power is limited. It's limited because they are up against a state that denied every single action just about that they tried to do to protect the city of Jackson. They, the state tried to take their revenue from the uh, uh, municipal airport, which was always Jackson's in revenue. The state denied them the right to pass a one cent sales tax to help pay for infrastructure. They got all this federal money and wouldn't give it to the city and then say, oh, it's bad leadership. I mean, that's reconstruction. That's reconstruction stuff. That's like the worst, you know, of the reconstruction reaction, right? When I say reconstruction, I mean the, the reaction against reconstruction. So, you know, that's an ongoing struggle. So unless we can connect Jackson, Mississippi today with 1971 rather than stop in 71 or stop in 68 at its founding, um, then, you know, we're always going to be nostalgic. So one of the dangers, ironically, and this is sort of the lesson here, is that even the most well-meaning people, nostalgia could undermine us. We've got to see these movements as ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. Um, and part of resurrecting the freedom dreams of those movements is to make arguments against the way they've been characterized. Something like reparations, for example. Reparations now has become a bourgeois um, parlor game, you know, among people who are like, you know, you got to prove that you're an African descendant person, and then when you get your reparations check, you can get your, you know, a Mercedes Benz or, a, you know, whatever. When in fact, reparations coming out of the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa was about startup costs, or startup money to make movements, to support movements, to change the nation and the world. And that's some of the lessons that you can get from this book, if you get this book. So, okay, yes. Um. Why do peop why do some people do good or bad things just for money? That's the best question I've ever had in my life. And y so you're at UCLA now? What's Are you at UCLA now? Cuz you're not in my class. <laughs> you got a UCLA special I'm, I'm assuming that you're probably a student at UCLA. No? I'm in third grade. Oh. <laughs> see? Well, I'll see you at UCLA. That's a really good question. You know, why do people do good and b do bad things for money, in fact? Um, it's hard to do a lot of good things just for money. Well, yeah, go ahead. last time, like, I saw many police cars when we were driving to here, and, the and my mother thought that the police cars 
we're, we're trying to protect the president only for money. Yes. That's what I'm saying. Like, Your mother's just, right. Just doing good things for money. Well, okay, here's the simplest answer I can, I can give it. Oh, before I give, before I give an answer, why do you think that's the case? Hmm. Well, it makes a lot of sense because presidents are very bad, like what you said. Right. Exactly. Now, do you think there could be a good president? No. And, and, <laughs> and, and why is that? Well, because they always want all the power. Yes. Yes. They didn't want to. Be, they didn't want to control everybody. Is there a better way to make the government so that there's not a, a person has so much power? Hmm, I will think about it. You think about it? Yeah. I bet you have the answer too. Yeah, I will get the answer. These, these are really good questions, and this is the question that you should always ask your teacher because what's going to happen when you get to other grades, they're going to have you do stuff like. You're going to read the Constitution. You're going to learn about civics. You're going to learn about government. And they're always going to convince you that somehow this system is the best. But what you just said, that maybe it's not. And you should be free. I don't want to get you in trouble, but free to tell your teachers, well, maybe there's another way to think about how to let the power be in the hands of all the people in this room rather than just the president. You think? I give you power, and that's why, how old are you? I'm eight. You are exactly the age to vote, <laughs> eight years old. Eight. No, you really, I mean, I, 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 I swear, I, you know, there's a, there's a thing in this book, I say that, well, I say nine years old, so I'll give, you, I'll give you credit for eight, that, you know, people should be able to vote at age eight or nine. People just do that because they don't want kids to do the wrong thing so that the president like what? Like what is someone who's good wants to be a president? They're not letting the kids do it because the kids, because people, because people think kids just want just want the person who's good to be the president. Yes. So, so like, so like the other people. See, you just basically solved two hundred years of problems. Because if kid, no, I'm telling you, if kids want good people to be the president, then should then kids should be the only ones to vote, right? Yeah, but then people won't let them because they choose the bad people to. Exactly, because they get paid. Yes. Who pays them? Who pays them? Capitalists. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you do a good job. <laughs> Thank you. This is great. So you're working hard over there, oh. Mama. <laughs> wow. <laughs> hey, I know, Mom. I can follow that, right? No, no, I was first thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to follow that? And now I'm thinking, wow, it's such an honor to follow that. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. And, and this is why I have hope. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But Robin, I, I've said this to you. I want to say it to everybody. I mean, the book that changed my life was Hammer and Ho, which I read in college. Thank you. And if you buy one book tonight, you, of course, buy Freedom Dreams. But if you buy two, <laughs> try to find Hammer and Ho. It's amazing. Thank you. Um, my question is about history and the black radical imagination. Do you see shifts in that imagination or changes relative to the level of struggle? I mean, I'm sure you do. But how does the black radical imagination form and reform relative to the amount of struggle, whether it's nationalistic struggle or multiracial struggle, how does it uh, percolate relative right. to what's happening in the streets? Right. Well, I think you hit it right on the head, which is to say that um, there is a relationship between the, the character, and I don't want to say in terms of quantity, but in terms of the qualitative change in struggle, that it does open up different kinds of possibilities. And I'll give you like a really precise example, which I don't write about in Freedom Dreams, but let's talk about like the Montgomery bus boycott, where at first, you know, when it was a, a sensibility that is unfair for people to have to pay at the front of the bus, get out and go to the back of the bus, or get out 
and go to the back door and get up, that that was the issue of dignity. And over time, when the Montgomery bus boycott took off, and people began to organize around providing transportation for each other to make sure people don't have to walk everywhere, um, where mass meetings, you know, and not just Dr. King speaking, but just mass meetings with people together, began to think about the world historical significance of that boycott. What does it mean to wage the struggle against the system of segregation, not just a seat at the, in the front of the bus, and it changed the demands, and the demands changed. They went from, you know, don't move the placards to eliminate the placards altogether to we want black bus drivers to we actually need uh, a different kind of infrastructure for, for black life to, to, mm -hmm. to thrive. And I think that it's that qualitative leap of people together fighting a fight that looks small at first and realize what's possible. And I think that is the key thing. Um, movements, more intense struggles produce the sense of something that's greater and more possible than before. And one other example I'll give, which is sometimes movements that are not even intended to do good things could produce possibilities. Uh, in a, again, a precise example is Rick Fantasia talks about this in his book. In, during World War II, there were all these hate strikes where as a result of black workers coming from the South, being hired because of the shortage of, of labor into jobs that were considered white industrial jobs, and these were hate strikes of women and men. That then produced the wildcat as a strategy. And the wildcat, they realized, was effective. The wildcat strike then was, was transformed in the post-war period as part of a massive strike wave that became interracial mm. and actually became a strike against capital to the point where the labor movement was like, you know, you, no more wildcat strikes. And so what did we get to try to fight it? Taft Hartley. So Taft Hartley is like, you can't have wildcat strikes. It's against, it's against federal law. Mm. And you could see exactly how the intensification of struggle produces new qualitative changes, new possibilities, and an equal reaction from the state mm. and from forces to suppress it. And that's why movements are always, a, it's, it's, a, it's a moving target, mm. always in motion. Uh, so that's my, my answer. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dave. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm interested in the, me the mechanics of your argument. So mm -hmm. my question is, how do you make an imagination of reality? So particularly when, like this last question, the, the imagination changes, right? But also when the ultimate goal is um, like black political power, when the ultimate goal is a world free of racism and capitalism, right? Like how do you, how do you make this imagination of reality? Right. Well, first of all, the imagination I'm talking about isn't so far from reality. In fact, it's a response to reality. And many of the movements we're talking about are not pie in the sky movements. I mean, we're talking, I mean, specifically, um, if you take reparations, or you take black feminism, or if you take um, the movements to try to establish a homeland for black people, um, you know, there's nothing wild about saying, you know, you promised me 40 acres and a mule, and I want that. Or the 49th state movement that says, you know what, there's nothing for us here in this land so we're going to find our own. And that manifests itself in the actual concrete movements. Some of those movements are about moving to Haiti. Some of them are about moving to Liberia or, or West Africa. Some of them are about creating all black towns like Mount Bayou, for example. Um, in some cases, for black women you know, who, who were the drafters, for example, of the Combahee River Collective, they had very specific demands. And then they had other demands that were on top of those specific demands. So on the one hand, they're like, you know, sexual violence against black women is something that's just should be fought and we should be protected from, protect ourselves from. And we need to have socialism. Because the only way that we can actually protect ourselves from this kind of violence is not just through socialism alone, but it's going to create the conditions for a, a structure that cares for people differently. 
So all those things are in play at the same time. Um, the other thing about the sort of radical imagination is that it's not like you go to sleep and wake up with a dream. It's that you're in struggle and you begin to see the limits of your own um, demands. That these demands sometimes are sh stopgap measures. Sometimes these demands you realize, you don't realize until you actually do it. They are demands that create reforms that reinforce power against you. But you don't know it until it happens, unless you can sort of think ahead, right? So in many ways, it's not so much about mechanics as much as process. You know, we always think of movements in terms of like bulk numbers of people, um, a set of principles and demands, and then you try to make it happen. You try to make it happen based on your list. But part of the argument I was making about about rejecting the notions of success, how we define how we define movements as successful, or not successful, to get past that requires uh, thinking deeply about um, what changes, what changes at, as your movement moves, as your movement changes. And so Freedom Dreams is really about producing those new ideas and new possibilities and recognizing the place where the, the, the ideas that you had are only, are limited, you know? So there's no fixed mechanics, you know? And that's, um, and, and part of what I try to do with the book is talk about the movements we don't talk about and to show that even in the middle of the civil rights movement, when, you know, think about how many times you go to a class and you like watch Eyes on a Prize and you think, okay, here's the story. You start with the Montgomery bus boycott, then you have SNCC and CORE, then you have then 66, SNCC breaks apart. In, in the middle of, in fact, the year before the m March on Selma, people don't know that at Fisk University, the Revolutionary Action Movement had a black nationalist conference at Fisk in Nashville in 1964, right? That existed. And they're like, we want world revolution at Fisk. So when we start to realize that these, ex these movements are existing together and that some of the people in RAM are talking to people inside of SNCC, that you begin to understand like how they shift their position, you know? Um, and that there are many, many freedom dreams happening all at once, you know, in conversation. Does that help you? Okay. I know time is up, right? Right. Uh, let's uh, give another round of applause for Professor Kelly for the wonderful talk. Uh, if you want copies of the book, we are selling